Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Reports Weekly Cyber Report, sponsored by Northrop Grumman. I'm your host, Vago Maradian. Joining us again today is Chris Valentino, the Vice President for Information Warfare and Cyber Survivability at Northrop Grumman. Chris, welcome back. Thank you. Good to have you back on. Uh, last time you were talking about cyber resiliency uh, and survivability. This time we're going to talk a little bit about information warfare. And there's this sense that information warfare is about propaganda or information operations, while there is far, far more to the field uh, than that. What's information warfare and why is it so important? Information warfare you know, is, a, is a term that's uh, grown up over time from you know, the areas that you mentioned, including inf information operations. And you know, at the end of the day, information warfare is, is really about denying, degrading, uh, destroying, usurping um, our adversaries. Uh, and so it's about you know, projecting force within, within cyberspace. Um, you know, at the heart of, of all weapon systems and all capabilities we have um, are these computer systems and they certainly are vulnerable. <clears throat> and information warfare is a, you know, is a means of uh, projecting that power in to produce an effect. Um, each service, you know, looks at it just a slightly different way in the in the way they implement um, and they view information warfare. But it, it really is about projecting power um, and warfighting capabilities into cyberspace. Let's talk a little bit about DoD strategy because, as you noted, each of the services does have a different approach and a different view. Talk to us about how DoD is integrating uh, this field to get the kind of synergies that we need to get and to address some of the mm -hmm. gaps, seams, and differences about how everybody's been looking at this problem? Yeah, it's a very good question. Each service has had a, has a, has a different approach about uh, which components they've chosen to integrate or not integrate. Um, the Air Force is still at the Air Force Information Warfare uh, Command in San Antonio as part of the 16th Air Force. Um, and in their implementation, they've combined uh, networks with uh, traditional offensive cyber and intelligence into into one organization. Um, the Army has a slightly different approach to it with the stand-up of Army, cyber, Army Information Warfare Command, which will integrate cyber, uh, electronic warfare, and and signals. <clears throat> and then the Navy has a, a far more broader implementation, which places all of those into the 10th fleet. Um, I, I think in each specific implementation, you know, there's it, and it, core, course, and core interesting takeaway, um, and it's really about leveraging the capabilities that each service brings that's unique uh, to be able to use those capabilities to, again, be able to project power into, into cyberspace. So if you, if you study it, you'll see that you know, the Air Force you know, is, is very keen and interested and focused on how best to utilize their platforms um, to be able to both deliver cyber effects, but also defend you know, from, from adversarial threat. And same in the Army. And so the Army looks to align their doctrine around cyber signals and electronic warfare, electronic attack, because again, it's focused on their, their platforms and their ability to be able to project uh, power and at the same time defend. <clears throat> and then the Navy, you know, if you look at how they're organized, right, it's, it, it integrates many functions into one because that's typically how the Navy operates with capabilities on a, say, an afloat platform. So how is DoD pushing everybody to a more unitary vision? Because, you know, we consistently find that unless the UD or Congress gets involved and sort of pushes to address these gaps and seams, the services kind of keep doing their own thing because it works in their doctrine, in their mindset and maybe doesn't right. work as well from a collective standpoint. And we only find out what the problem was. I mean, I hate to say after, you know, on, on 9-12, uh, we go, right. th those were all the gaps and seams. I know that that's what the cyberspace, uh, cybersecurity uh, Solarium uh, Commission was trying to focus mm -hmm. on, is to do that 9-12 assessment before 9-11. Um, talk to us a little bit about, how, you know, the progress we're making in getting these guys to a more sort of concerted approach as opposed to doing better what it is they're doing and how they're doing it? Well, I would point to the, the evolution of uh, U.S. Cyber Command, you know, from, from stand-up a little over 10 years ago to, to now, um, and, and the importance that that combatant command 
brings to help pull together those gaps and seams. Um, if you look at each each one of the services and how they're organized, well, each one has a different flavor of, of how they're they're implementing their organizational structure and which components are included and not included. Um, at the end of the day, <clears throat> between U.S. Cyber Command and and NSA, you know, you have a leader that is in place to help um, integrate, coordinate across those um, various services and how they've chosen to implement their their organizations. So I think from a combatant command standpoint, um, that that really helps uh, tie the pieces together. And then <clears throat> from an NSA perspective, being a combat support agency, helps on the intel side to integrate those functions across the services and if then you set that in construct of the overall um, cyber mission force construct the cmf construct where you have combat mission teams uh, national mission teams and cyber protection teams um, that then is at the the implementation level from an operational perspective and within those three um, defined structures you have that you see the integration and the cross collaboration both across service um, and across specific functional areas that they have. What's the best operational structure to control and oversee information warfare from the strategic level all the way down to the tactical level? If you look at the Air Force as an example and how they've evolved uh, and, and the integration of the, the 24th and the 25th Air Force down to the 16th Air Force, it's kind of one thing to, to to stare at. And so when you look at that, you see that they've taken you know, Title, Title 50, you know, Intel responsibilities and capabilities, and then a Title 10 mission for defense and projecting offensive force. Mm -hmm. And they look and they've integrated those right in, into a single boss, um, which provides you both some strategic and tactical opportunities. Then you see how that rolls into Air Combat Command and the ACC. Um, and so from an Air Force construct rolling up an ACC, it shows the intent of being able to integrate these cyber capabilities and information warfare capabilities into what I would describe as mainstream warfighting. And then break break, you know, you have that roll up into US Cyber Command um, and the strategic construct that the combatant command has. And so you put those two together, I think it helps tell the story of how you go from strategic all the way into tactical operation. And what's the best way to train information warfare personnel? Well, it's such a broad set of, of skills. Um, and, and so from a, a, a training perspective, there are cer certainly you know, preparatory skills that are required, both in the mission domain as far as <clears throat> from a doctrine perspective how would you how do you conduct information warfare what are those you know phases of conflict what do you do in those phases of conflict so that's one vein there's technical training that's required depending on what that information warfare um soldier sailor airman is going to perform right so there's there's specific technical training that's required and then there's you know the, the overall sort of operational construct and legal frameworks that are required uh, in, in traditional war fighting. So it's not so much a, a one size fits all, but I would say that's a preparatory set of skills. Mm -hmm. and then as you move to mission and operations, you really need to train as you fight in, in this domain. Things move fast, things can change, um, and you have to have you know, the right environments to be able to uh, train your mission operators against those. You know, it's almost like a you know, from a mil from an exercise perspective, right? You would always mm -hmm. go out and and train, 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 and then execute. It's the same thing in information warfare. You know, there's a need to train continuously, train the force so that they're ready, um, and then do that at various levels, all the way from acquiring skills to mission rehearsal. Chris. Thanks very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Please follow our daily interviews and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, and LinkedIn. And check out our weekly cyber report sponsored by Northrop Grumman. For more than 80 years, Bell has pushed past the boundaries of what's possible to drive aviation forward, going above and beyond flight, bellflight.com. Thanks again to Bell for their generous sponsorship, and we'll see you again tomorrow.